So very warm welcome to everyone joining us today. This is the Echohal webinar series and it's a very special one because it's an Ask the Experts on Wi-Fi security. And if you have noticed, we're not in our usual webinar space. We are actually here in person together. And we have myself, we have Mac, we've got the fabulous psychic Stu on the webinar with us too, but we have got a couple of absolutely industry experts and some good friends. We have Mr. Troy Martin and Phil Morgan. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Hi guys. hello everyone. Hi guys. It's an honor, and girls. honor to have you here. Thank you, sir. We've never done a webinar with both of you at the same time. We had you separately, but never together. It's yeah. true. Yeah. It's true. And the other special thing is that we're here in person. So we are here live from WLPC, the main conference. It is still going on. We managed to pull these guys away for a little bit of time to come and join us. So how have you found WLPC this week? Very good. It's always drinking from a fire hose. Yeah. There's, uh, the days are long. There's tons of information, being able to see and connect with everybody. Uh, I think it is the Wi-Fi conference uh, to go to and to attend, but it's it, it's a long week. It feels like we've been here for a week and a half already. It's only been a few days. Yeah, well, I've been here for a week now because of the boot camps. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so much new content. And what I liked about this year, some new faces. It's not the usual uh, crowd that got up. It's, it's, there's some new people, and they showed their skills, gave us information, and so much information. <laughs> Yeah, it was really great to see people in person again. It's been a while since we've seen seen you guys in person. So yeah, it's really nice to catch up and see people. Loads of, loads of great content. And uh, don't worry if you wasn't able to be here to see it for yourself in person. All of the uh, presentations go up on YouTube, I think, at some point next week. So keep an eye out for them. And we can now kick off our webinar on Wi-Fi security. So what is Wi-Fi security and what should we be concerned about? And I'm um, very sorry to say, I'm just throwing out a warning now that uh, since we've got Phil Morgan on here, there is a high chance you're going to be very paranoid by the time this webinar is over. So he <laughs> does a great job of making everyone very, very paranoid. I was very paranoid when I uh, just sat in the room for about 20 minutes before the webinar started. So um, maybe Phil, you can kick off and you know tell us some of the things around you know Wi-Fi security that we need to like watch out for and some things like that to you know get the juices flowing. For but you. before we continue, guys, uh, let's reshare your screen map because the slides they say that they are loading on our screens. Oh, all right. Let me, uh, let me try again. Maybe it's the, uh, the Wi-Fi of the hotel that we're at this week. Who knows? <laughs> I have a story with that when you're, whenever you're ready. Why don't okay. you go for the story, Justin? I'll do the story while you wait. How about now? Can we see? Yep. It's yeah. working now. Uh, All right. Thank you. Cool. So we did the boot camp with a deep dive on security. So obviously, client isolation is a big deal on the guest network. And one of the students says, um, there's no client isolation on the WLPC network. So I thought I'd have a quick chat with Keith because we're going to mention it today. Keith's like, well, there should be. Mm -hmm. And I explicitly asked them for this and they said he was definitely configured. So one of the first lessons there is double check what you think you've configured or you've told or asked someone else to configure. And the big paranoia about Wi-Fi security is everybody's got security gates, barbed wires, cameras and things. The big takeaway about wireless security is you can attack someone wirelessly from across the road in the Walmart parking lot. You don't need to be present. You need to be nearby, but not present to do Wi-Fi security. And that's the real scary thing about security is Wi-Fi is, is just so easy to abuse because of people making so Phil, mistakes. You yes. said that we wanted to have client separation enabled yeah. on our Wi-Fi. Client isolation. Is that just because we don't want anyone to attack anyone over Wi-Fi? Yes, basically. Okay. Because if I'm connected to the same Wi-Fi that you are, and they haven't configured client isolation... Well, you wouldn't attack me, of course, would you? Never. Never. How about Matt? Probably. <laughs> he did say before, uh, you know, I was going to just pop out and grab a drink. He's like, make sure you lock your laptop, especially around me. <laughs> I thought, I thought, okay, well, I'm definitely locking my laptop now. Who knows what would happen otherwise. <clears throat> so one, one of the challenges I think that happens with security is you have good intentions, like turning on features like client isolation. Yes. Um, but I was running the LoRaWAN deep dive. And in our lab, we were connecting from our laptops to Raspberry Pis. And when client isolation was turned on, we lost the ability to connect to our clients. Right? And so we did what all insightful networking uh, engineers would do at that point. We pulled out our travel routers, plugged into the wall connection, and bypassed the yes. whole ton network and any security that was there. Yep. Right? So if you make the barriers too difficult so that you can't accomplish your business needs, your business purposes, 
users will find workarounds for your security and then open up potentially other holes into your network. So what you're just saying now is it's not only extremely important to secure your networks, but also make sure that they are slick and easy to onboard, access and use so people they are not frustrated while trying to use them so they don't have an urge and feel like they need to do something on their own instead of just connecting to our networks. Exactly. Well, here's an extra thing. One of the deep dive guys came up and says, oh, you caused me so much problem this week. I'm like, well, what did I do? He said, you turned on client isolation. Apparently, in his deep dive, he was getting devices to connect to each other, and he assumed client isolation wasn't turned on. And he, he again, had to do something to sidetrack it because they couldn't do the deep dive <laughs> with client isolation turned on. I want to go back to what, um, what Troy said, actually. So we are staying in a, a hotel chain and they've obviously got their own Wi-Fi here. And you said what you did was that you went and got your own travel router and you plugged it into the network so that, you know, you could kind of bypass all that kind of good stuff. Um, but now taking it back to, you know, not, not necessarily from the security perspective, but what sort of impact when users come in and they plug in their own travel routers inside of a Wi-Fi network that others users, other users are trying to use, what sort of impact could that potentially have on you know the the Wi-Fi uh, of the guests that are actually staying at the hotel trying to use that network? Well, one of the the things that we all like to do before we uh, deploy our network is we like to go through the exercise of uh, putting through a design, right? Predictively modeling, uh, generating uh, the ideal placement for access points, uh, playing with power levels, adding wall attenuations, building that perfect model for that perfect design, and then we implement that solution. If people walk around into that environment and set up rogue APs, well, that takes away a lot of the hard work that we went through and those rogue APs end up creating a whole bunch of interference. Uh, if they're using the wrong channels, yep. they have uh, OBSS situations and it, uh, it takes away the user experience that you were trying to deliver for guests at the hotel. So not only do you potentially open up security risks, uh, it ends up breaking uh, a lot of your efforts as part of the Wi-Fi design. On 2.4 gigahertz, they're not going to use 1611. Most likely, yeah. most, most wow. of the MiFi's try and find the quietest <laughs> network, which we, is not one six eleven. Yeah, we actually we actually brought a uh, travel little travel router with us. That's how we configure the uh, the lights. And we first plugged it in, turned it on, and by default, of course, on two point four gigahertz. Can you guess what channel we wanted to use? Three. <laughs> Very close. Very it's using close. it's using channel two at forty megahertz wide. I was going to say oh, forty megahertz. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so, so, sorry, anyone near near us that was trying to use the Wi-Fi whilst we were setting up the lights for the webinar. But um, yeah, we did actually go in and we reconfigured it ourselves, so it's not uh, causing too much of an effect for everyone else around. So, so one thing I tell people is the good thing about Wi-Fi is it's free and anyone can use it. The main problem with Wi-Fi is it's free and anyone can use it. <laughs> So with our portable router on channel 2 at 40 megahertz, we are pretty much, assuming that we are using it actively, we would be contributing to tons of retransmissions, tons of collisions on channels both 1 and 6 at the same time. So yeah. don't do it. Never bond channels on 2.4. You might even hit 11 at the, at the, at the right end. Very possibly. Quite possibly. <laughs> a little bit of edge can yeah. interfere with 11. So I mean, you've got everybody, right? Surely no, surely no one attending a Wi-Fi conference would bring their own Wi-Fi stuff to mess with the Wi-Fi here, would they? No, why no. would they? <laughs> Extremely unlikely. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we've got some general kind of like security tips now, uh, Phil, from your yeah. vast, vast experience of working in security. <laughs> Maybe you can give some of our guys and girls some, some security tips for them. So number one, change your defaults. Probably change your SSI default and your password default your user default and your admin default, because they're, they're on the internet. Uh, I've read a couple of articles over the years where they say, hide your SSID. <laughs> Don't hide your SSID. If a, if a threat actor, hacker type is walking past and they see a hidden SSID, they're going to immediately wonder what you're hiding, right? Um, have, a, have antivirus, have malware. But doesn't having a hidden SSID mean people can't find it and it's more secure? No, oh. because it's because it's a lot of people don't understand that, but it still sends out the beacons. It just hides the name in the um, beacons. And then when a client device goes to actually associate, yeah. then it, what it, happens? It says, welcome to the SSID. But yeah, welcome to Phil's um, yep. super secure SSID. <laughs> now, well, the, the only uh, somewhat valid use case that I've, that I've heard of over the years for hiding your SSID is I describe it as a layer eight uh, motivation. 
is that if you have too many SSIDs and it's overwhelming when people pull up their mobile device and there's too, too many listed SSIDs, yep. Yep. to try to reduce that list, uh, you could hide your SSID, but it does prevent some uh, roaming challenges as clients move across your environment. If they don't hear the SSID name, SSID name in the beacon, uh, some clients have difficult times uh, roaming. Yeah. And it does mess up guest networks. So yeah. don't, don't hide your guest network. Mm -hmm. That causes so many complications. Yeah. So well, if you hide guest network, then 99% of guests, they wouldn't be even allowed where. They wouldn't know where to look for to get uh, this same right. name. <laughs> but when they check in, they're given this piece of paper, and then they can't see. So the very first thing they do is they come down and say, I can't see the network. Yeah. Or type it in, then they'll misspell it. Because it's case sensitive, they'll misspell it. And it just causes so many problems. Of course it does. A lot of people don't realize that most hotel chains in the US anyway don't have any local technical support. They contract out the support. So if you go down and say, my Wi-Fi is not working, they say, call these guys. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. All they can do is turn the machine on and off, mm -hmm. or off and on, which of course is going to annoy everybody. Sure. Um, OK. Uh, we have a question that's come into the Q&A. Okay. We have three questions actually. Three, nice. Okay, so we had this one that just come in. It says, uh, "How good are the various WLAN vendors at providing guidelines for hardening the configuration of their wireless LAN devices?" Pretty good, um, exceptionally good. So you got to find it, and then you got to start doing it. Okay. So a, a general Google search of your vendor device hardening um, should come up with, and of course, if not then contact the vendor and say, why don't I have this? So to Phil's point, or Phil's point about uh, changing your passwords and the defaults, uh, a lot of the vendors, one of the first things you do as you run through the wizards is define and set uh, the username and the, the passwords, right? So instead of logging in with default credentials and never being forced or prompted to change that, one of the things they do is right off the bat get you to change that, which is a, which is a good first step. Of course it is. And we have another very nice question here. So we were talking about like high level things when it comes to security let's do a little bit of a deeper dive and mm -hmm. maybe focus for a second on enterprise security because we are like talking about the event security and guest networks and hiding ssids so let's introduce the enterprise security mm -hmm. so guys what is the enterprise security and how does it differ from the events wi-fi that we are using today what is that one? Yeah, so I think with the, the, the work that the IEEE has put in over time, they created uh, different levels of authentication and encryption that we could use. Um, so you, at a high level, you had your open networks, your pre-shared key kind of networks for entering a password, uh, and then your EAT-based authentication using 802.1x. And from the IEEE's perspective, their intention was for enterprise always to use 802.1x uh, for the authentication. They never uh, expected or, or wanted PSKs to end up in the enterprise. Right? And if you correctly implement your 802.1x authentication, which I would kind of argue is uh, table stakes in uh, today's world. Uh, most enterprise uh, deployments do have 802.1x uh, configured on at least one of their SSIDs. And again, there are ways to uh, improperly configure it that can open you up to, to weaknesses. But if done correctly, it can be uh, quite robust and resilient. But what we are seeing is a transition or migration of consumer grade devices into the enterprise network, yep. right? So for whatever reason they want to connect, uh, you know, extra printers or devices, um, you know, other things they find from home, you know, the CEO brings in is this shiny new toy and you need to get it connected to your network and you start making compromises on your security deployments. Uh, that's where you can run into a lot of problems. So what you're trying to say is .1x <laughs> enterprise security is something that we want to use in the enterprise environment, but mm -hmm. sometimes to make it easier for some types of users to use, we start compromising on, on security. Constantly. So what is the ideal scenario? How do we secure the devices and how do we onboard those devices for everyone, including CEO? What would you do as a best practice tips? Well, th th there are levels. If you can do EAP.1x radius, do it. One of the most important things you have to do is train your users because the successful attack that I've done against EAP to the 1x you can't break it to the one. No, you create a false certificate and create a, an evil twin, and you hope someone's not paying attention. And it comes up and says, hey, have you noticed your certificate's invalid? Do you want to continue? Sure. And then, then when they put in the username and password, they type that into your access point, not the original. So you are talking about EAP peep? Any kind, any kind of EAP. 
uh, EAP TLS is more difficult because that just relies on um, certificates, but EAP PEEP in particular, if you do an username and password with radius server authentication, if you can fool someone to say continue anyway, there are a lot of people who will fall for that one. Well, I would, I would have guessed that most of people, they would just ignore the warning. Do you want to continue? Do you trust the certificate? Yes. Do you of course know we do. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> they want to continue? Yeah, why not? Yeah. So, so there's a hierarchy. If, if you can get, and you can, of course, configure policies on your devices so they aren't allowed to bypass legitimate certificates. But you've got EAP, and, you've got EAP radius at the top. EAP TLS is lovely, but you've got to now onboard all of your client devices, which is is ever so inconvenient. It's, uh, there's, there's been a really nice question that's come in just on this sure, yeah. topic, and it's around um, IoT devices. Mm -hmm. And now there's quite a lot of IoT devices out there that they're not going to support 802.1x. Exactly. Not yet. So yeah. uh, particularly in like, the industrial space. So is it mm -hmm. common practice to have a separate SSID with a pre-shared key to support those? Or what would you suggest for these types of IoT devices? Yes, on its own VLAN with a firewall, isolating it from the rest of the network. Because you don't want your uh, thermostat port scanning your domain controller, right? So you want it right. definitely isolated, yeah. isolated in uh, segment. Access talking. control is simple why it is and isn't allowed. Why yeah. is my thermostat trying to communicate with my email server is a very important question. Yeah. Exactly. You know what's actually really good about the last piece on that slide there? It says you never use the deprecated protocols. And, and obviously in a new network, yeah, we would you know, uh, you know, build out a new network properly. But uh, we're still seeing, I mean, what are you, what are you guys seeing out there is, um, I'm still seeing a lot of uh, TKIP environments still being created because of old legacy handheld scanners, right? Warehouses that are incapable of, you know, mass upgrading, you know, their thousand scanners that they have. Um, and it's, it's almost still like the Wild West. Are we almost out of that? Well, we'd, we'd, like, to, we'd like to hope so. Um, one of the things around TKIP that I didn't realize as well um, at first is that not only is it obviously not as a secure method, uh, of authentication to get onto the wireless network, but it also limits the amount of speed you can transfer because mm -hmm. where you're capped, was it 54 megs yes. per second? Uh, one special stream. One, yeah, so you can yeah. maximum you can do if you've got TKIP enabled on your network. Let's say, for example, maybe you accidentally turned on TKIP and you didn't know what you were doing when you're setting up your configuration of your SSID and it's turned on for not just your IoT devices or your legacy devices, but also for any of your newer devices that may be connecting. If you've got TKIP enabled, it means that you can only use one spatial stream plus 54 megabits per second maximum data rate. So even if you've got a brand new shiny Wi-Fi 6 iPhone straight out of the box and that comes and connects to that network, it's not going to be able to use those juicy, fast, really super fast So you're speeds. punishing good devices by allowing WPA1. Yeah. yeah. And, and the reason people do that is by accident, or they do it because they've got an older device too, or oh, I want to get this older device and they need to upgrade the old device. It's, it's hardcore, but hey, how about upgrading? You know, it's 18 years old now. Yes. Let's upgrade it. <clears throat> so just guys, so you know where we, where we are when it comes to different options for securing our networks. First one was web, multiple, like many years ago, like 1997, yep. when yep. Wi-Fi 802.11 Prime was released. Web is crackable in seconds. Then we have WPA1. Mm -hmm. Which uses TKIP, but it uses it uses the same web exactly. RSC algorithm. Yeah, yes. RSC four. Yes. So it's also crackable in seconds. Now that was just the quick reaction to crackability of web. So both web and WPA one they are crackable in seconds. So don't use them until you really have to. And if you have to use it for all devices, just make sure that the SSID WLAN is massively isolated and it can access just maybe this one telnet server and nothing else. Yep. So then. This is easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? So let's focus on something that gives us more options and it's still relevant today. So WPA2. Yep, which, so is, which is still 18 years old. Yes, <laughs> but <laughs> if you do it right, but then it's, it's, still, then it's, it's still very difficult to, to crack. It's still considered very secure, right? So we've discussed... Well, well, actually, that's a really good point because I do this in the, in the hacking class. We configure WPA. You do hacking classes. Uh, pen testing, my mistake. Um, <laughs> we do pen testing classes. So potato, potato, right? You go to martial arts, they got to teach you to punch so you can punch while someone just blocks. So um, on the pen testing hacking class, we do WPA and I said, okay, how much more secure do you think WPA2 is? How much longer do you think it'll take? And it takes exactly the same time because we attack the four-way handshake, which is identical. So we don't attack the encryption. Uh, we attack the four-way handshake and the pre-shared key. Which brings us back to problem with the 802.1x and pre-shared key. Today we have 
uh, personal appreciate keys coming out, which is a much better. Is a, a thing I'm seeing more and more today is I'm calling it IT appreciate key, where the IT department onboards your IoT devices, and they onboard your device, and you don't know the appreciate key, so you can't give it to anybody. So if the appreciate key is long enough and it's not shared yes. amongst other people, then yes. it's considered quite secure and difficult to attack offline. It's attackable, yes. but it will take forever to crack it. It'll take like a million years on, a, on an Intel i7. Of course, if you have an array, it comes. So it's all to do with the function of complex length and complexity. Okay. And one thing I firmly believe in is longer is better than complex. So there's the famous cartoon of is it XKCD, okay. where they have the four words. And then they have like this highly complex troubadour with numbers and characters and things. And the four words are infinitely more rememberable and infinitely more secure. Okay, so even if these four words are dictionary words, yeah. it's still better to have Battery a mixture horse. of four easy to remember words yeah. instead of trying to make it super difficult, complex, yes. rotate it on a weekly basis and have, have it so difficult that you will write it down and stick it to that's, the back of your keyboard. That's the problem, the right? You write it down. <laughs> stick it to the back of your keyboard or you stick it in a book that you carry in your bag. Once you write it down, your entropy drops. Yeah. Because it's because it's easier to steal something that's written. How down. how about um, you know, those password manager tools? Is it better to put it in something yes. like that? But then how do I if I've locked my laptop and I've got this like really long key and I can't remember it and I can't write it down, I can't access the password manager whilst I'm locked out of my machine. So what do you do but, then? So you need the one password, right? You need the one password to get into the password manager and maybe a, a different one. I never use the same password for two things, oh, ever. Okay. Always have unique passwords. I wonder how many people that are watching this right now are just going onto their different accounts <laughs> and are quickly changing their passwords. Or taking the cards under <laughs> the keyboards. Well, <laughs> a, a, actually, a very important question to ask the audience is, if your password to anything is your pet's name uh, and your birthday, that is bread and butter to a hacker. Don't you just then add like an exclamation mark at the end and it's like super safe? Well, they're aware of that now. So <laughs> what they'll do is they'll, they'll add exclamation mark because of course it's it's <laughs> shift one is the first one. So most people add an exclamation mark at the end, not a shift six or a, or a dollar. They always do shift one because it's, it's number Easy, one. Easiest. Yeah. I feel like I need to go and start changing some passwords now. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, if you ever walk into a room with Phil, just make sure you switch all of the Wi-Fi on all of your devices, because who knows what he's got He's got running on his... Uh... Well, I probably... You know about the Punagotchi? Mm -hmm. What? The Punagotchi. What is the Punagotchi? Oh, I should have brought it. It's a little... It looks like a little Tamagotchi. You build it on a Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. and it's a cute little thing that collects four-way handshakes. The thing is, it's got nice mode and it's got evil mode. Mm -hmm. If you turn evil mode on, it will start to authenticate and you sort of capture So it's like a Tamagotchi actually. for hackers. Yeah. Yeah. Does, Does it change color? Happy. Does it change color when you actually What's press it? the buttons? It goes red and green, red and green. It's got little smiley faces. So Ooh. the Tamagotchi was the game from about 20 years ago. Yeah, like that, yeah. The kids, had, you had to feed it and play with it. Mm. If it gets bored, it sits there and, you know, starts getting upset and sad. Well, so we've um, we mentioned now like the four-way handshake a few times. Just conscious that we may have some people on that are not aware of what the four-way handshake is. So I don't know if you feel or Troy, you just want to quickly explain what is this four-way handshake you keep trying to capture? Is it like do we all just like, start shaking hands? There's four of us. Do we just shake hands all like one in a time? Or we, do that? we can't do it on screen. It's a uh, secret handshake. Uh, <laughs> it's a secret handshake. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just maybe just take that five seconds to explain what the four-way handshake is, so we make sure everyone's on the same page that's watching today. So so. All of Wi-Fi security uses the four-way handshake. And the four-way handshake exchanges random data, MAC address and a random number between the AP and the client to create a unique key. So with, with, whether you're using personal or enterprise, when you connect to the Wi-Fi network, you always end up with a personal key that is created per connection per user. The problem with pre-shared key is the master key that it starts off with is called the PMK, pairwise master key, with it a two to one X EAP that is always unique. With a pre-shared key, everybody starts off with the same key. So if you break that key and then capture the four-way handshake, you can decrypt people's data. So the four-way handshake is done after you've authenticated, well, actually, kind of. <laughs> pre-shared key actually uses the four-way handshake to mm -hmm. authenticate it. If ever you get it where you do a wireless capture and you, the, the four-way handshake keeps stopping at the second exchange. That's because you typed in the wrong pre key. Okay, so with EAP, 
if you manage somehow to crack the encryption and yeah. only the existing session is decryptable. Exactly. Okay. So, if you, so at the bottom is the pairwise transient key. That's the key. That's the set of keys you use to do everything you need, including and encrypt the data. Okay. At the top is the pairwise master key, which is half of the pre, the pre-shared key is not your passphrase. Your passphrase is mixed 4,096 times with the SSID to give you the pre-shared key. That is chopped in half, and, and that's the PMK. Uh, when you connect with 802.1x EAP, as a result of the successful authentication, you are given a master session key, which becomes the PMK. So the PMK on personal is always the same, and the PMK on 802.1x EAP is always different. Good and to know. whatever you do because of the four-way handshake, which is one of the most important things we have in the security of Wi-Fi, that always gives you a unique encryption key. But if I know your PMK and I capture your four-way handshake, I can calculate your encryption. Of course you can. Yes. Yes, and we will come back to more dot one x discussions after the poll. So let the poll read the poll. And the poll question is, what is your biggest challenge in designing for wireless security? A, rogue devices. B, bring your own device, BYOD. C, captive portals. Or D, authentication and encryption. We'll leave the uh, poll running for a few moments time uh, and then let everyone get the opportunity to make sure you vote. Uh, some very interesting uh, results coming in at the moment by the looks of things. We will share with you in a, in a few seconds time. Just let a few more people have the opportunity to make sure you vote. So if you see it up on the screen, make sure you pick one of the options, then you hit submit, and then we're going to be able to uh, share these results with you. So <clears throat> I will now end the poll and I will share these results with you. So uh, interestingly that it was um, fairly evenly split actually between BYOD and the authentication and encryption. What would you say, Troy, would have, if you had the, if you were voting today on the poll, what would you have gone for? So it, I think it's a really interesting poll. Uh, each one, I think, from Thank a you. different, uh, <laughs> <laughs> from a, a different uh, perspective has its own uh, challenges. Um, the authentication and encryption, you got to think through the, the logic and the complexity that you're introducing to your users, what the devices uh, support, if you can install certificates on them, uh, or if they only support uh, pre-shared key, uh, or you know, maybe limited to certain types of e-based authentication. So if your challenge is on the, the device side of things, um, but to bring your own device uh, in environment as well, you have the challenges with the, the different types of devices uh, again. Um, devices that you have um, administrative control over or that you can onboard as through an MDM and push profiles and policies to them, that gives you some control over what devices or what networks those devices can connect. Uh, you can push hardened policies onto those devices to make them more uh, resilient and, and robust. But it's, the, uh, it's those wild, wild west type mm -hmm. of devices where you don't have any control over it. Um, you can't push policies onto those devices and control what they connect to. Um, but you still have a requirement to allow them access to your network. So it's making um, decisions that are appropriate to your environment uh, to delimit and control what access that they have while still allowing them uh, the connectivity that they're, they're demanding. How about you, Phil? What would be your answer? <clears throat> well, I think BYOD, because everybody thinks you know, BYOD saves money. But if you work in a university or a hospital, or if you work anywhere where you have, a, like a hotel, a hotel is a BYOD environment because mm -hmm. your customers are bringing your own devices. Now, you're not going to onboard them to a NAC or something at a hotel. So sometimes the BYOD solution is to let them connect to the guest network and only allow them to do web browsing and VPNs. Yeah. So BYOD is one of the most difficult. A lot of people think it saves money, but if you don't do it right, it just brings in security. I also agree with BYOD. That would be my vote. So it's always been our challenge where people, they wanted to bring their own devices, making sure that they are secure on the network yep. at the same time, making it slick and easy for them to onboard was always a pain. Well, the other problem with BYOD that a lot of people don't think about is if they take corporate data on their personal device home, how is that secured? Yeah. So, story for another day. So even if you manage to <laughs> yes. find a solution for secure and easy onboarding of those devices, making yep. sure that they, it's all encrypted and difficult to crack and hack. Yep. It's still about the data that you carry on those devices, right? Especially now with like European GDPR, New York and California following them. The concept of personal information 
is a new set of data that we are, have to be very, very paranoid and careful about. Because okay. it's, it's an interesting discussion. So, so how do you, how can you ensure that the data that is stored on the BYOD device is secure? What do you do? Typically, what we do today is with Apple and Android, they have something called containerization, where you've got little Johnny's photographs in one area, but there is a container that is created that is a part of the BYOD system. And you have, if you're going to do BYOD, you have to buy some kind of MDM, mobile device yeah. management system. And that then creates partitions on your system. Apple and um, Android uh, have APIs that will do this on your system. So when you take the data away with you, at any time that data is remote wiped, if you need it to be, if you leave the company, you just remove that partition. Oh, that makes sense. And why did I ask this question? So that means if you want to bring your personal device to a corporate environment and access it, you most likely will have to install something on your device. Oh yeah, they're going to spy on And some people, spy. they won't be happy with that approach, nope. right? Well, today it's all about optics, right? So if, if you're on the plane watching a Game of Thrones, right? To some people, Game of Thrones is very violent and, and has a lot of adult content. So, you know, you've got, you got your company name on the back of your laptop or your Apple, and you're watching Game of Thrones, and there are people behind that think it's inappropriate. So now they may say, okay, no, no adult content, no anything other than PG content. And you're like, but it's my device. Why aren't you yeah. letting me watch Game of Thrones on my device? And that's what the road we have to we have to go down. So you bring up a good point about the uh, the shoulder surfing. Yes. So not only is it managing the data that's at rest on the device. Yeah. It's what uh, what data are they accessing on their device where they are, right? So one example is if you allow doctors to access the medical records of patients on their mobile device, that's one thing. How do you secure their connection to the network? Make sure you're managing the data at rest. But what happens if that same doctor goes to the coffee shop? Yeah. Right, they got five minutes to kill while they're yeah. in line waiting for the coffee to brew, and they pull up their mobile device and from the coffee shop, over the the coffee shop's uh, Wi-Fi network, connect and start opening up patient records that people walking by can uh, can shoulder surf and look yeah. at those patient records. Uh, did you did you guys happen to go to a coffee shop this morning by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> we don't know what you mean. I'm just thirsty here. Yes. <laughs> Uh, since we're talking about BYOD and we talk about client devices, there has been like a really good question that came into the Q&A, which is kind of on this topic about, about client devices. Uh, and this question is around uh, Mac randomization and does this affect uh, security? And then if so, how? Well, if you're using personal pre-shared keys and your MAC address changes, it may not let you back on. On some systems. On some systems. So the, the solution to that is to have is to allow a personal pre-shared key be shared by multiple MAC addresses. Then you've got the problem, what if you share that with your friends? So there's a balance where you have to allow, you have to allow people to, to onboard their laptop and their phone mm -hmm. and to be aware that the MAC address may change. So it's, uh, it's constantly keeping us on our toes, right? Yeah, so some, some systems, uh, like it's a one-to-one -one relationship, yep. you get a key, on, you can only connect to one device. Uh, you can add administrative controls where that uh, you give a, a key to someone and they're allowed to connect one, three, or yep. five devices. Something that's reasonable. All of a sudden, you know, the start of the new school year or uh, Christmas comes around, they got some brand new devices they want to connect and they've exceeded their number of devices. Right now, you have to delete a device, remove a device from the system. So it's an administrative hurdle. Uh, or if they forget their key, and they have to generate a new key, now they have to apply that key to all their five devices yep. over again. So now it's, it's a management problem and you're creating barriers for users. And if it's too frustrating, they're gonna try and look for another way to and get onto your randomization, network. it will be extremely frustrating, right? Because every time your MAC address on your device changes, mm -hmm. then it's being treated as a new device. So you'll be hitting the limits faster. And every time MAC address changes, when you're, I don't know, here where we are now in a hotel environment, you'll be presented with a splash page again, and it can be a little bit annoying. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's a joke almost, because Mac randomization is to hide your privacy. But now you're mapping all those Mac addresses to your pre-shared key that's mapped to your name. Yeah. But Mac randomization is really when you go to the mall. But I don't say, I, I think it's an amazing thing to have the yes. macro randomization. In the mall, but not in your house. <laughs> that is true, but in your house you don't care, right? In your house, it's right. your house, your Correct. environment, your device, exactly. so it's yes. fine. Uh, but what I'm trying to say, I think, is we shouldn't be using in a public spaces or in hotels or whatever, security methods that rely 
on MAC addresses starting yes, today, right? We point. should start thinking forward. How do we move our authentication of the devices, onboarding of the devices, so it does not rely yeah. on MAC address? Yeah. And since we're at WLPC and there's been fantastic presentations all over the last few days, um, and we're talking about MAC randomization, MAC randomization uh, Jim Palmer did a mm -hmm. really good uh, presentation on MAC randomization, which will be up yes. on YouTube. Uh, probably in the next week or so. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper into map randomization, maybe get yourself a little bit even more paranoid, then make sure you check out that um, video on YouTube soon. And if you weren't slightly paranoid before the webinar, maybe you are a little bit more paranoid now, um, you know, you've got some some really good points here about um, only with an S. And what we mean, what do we mean by that? So I have like a family group, I'm sure they won't, none of them will be watching this, but I mean like a family group chat. Why not? I don't think they watch our webinars, I don't know why, but um, <laughs> quite often, all the time, like my mum or my nan, they'll throw a link into the group chat and I'll see it straight away and it'll be like HTTP colon forward slash forward slash something else and straight away I dismiss it. I'm not clicking on that link. Yes. Mm -hmm. Straight away, but it's always like my, it's, <laughs> sorry, mum and nan, if you are watching, but it's always my mum and nan that put these dodgy links into the group chat. Gotcha. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm, like <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not clicking on that. Like, if you want to tell me, so, so tell me something about this link. I'm, I'm, I'm not clicking on that yeah. on my device. But maybe there are people out there that, you know, they just see the link, like, like my mum and my nan, they just think, oh, okay, this is, could be an interesting website or something I should go and read. Why shouldn't they go onto these websites? I've seen a comment in the chat uh, before, like 20 minutes ago, I think, about maybe using open open, uh, so not have any hurdles yeah. of onboarding and splash pages and stuff like that. So if you are clicking on your HTTP colon forward forward slash, plus you are on open open network with no encryption, then everything that you open and see and watch is what, clear text. Yeah, if you do HTTP, yes, mm -hmm. including your username and password. Yeah, so be careful with that. Well, this, this is where earlier on we talked about having a good anti-malware platform and having a good anti-virus platform and a firewall. And a few slides back, I mentioned in particular Cisco Umbrella. It, it's a little Ella. expensive. Hey, hey. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got that. But um, what, what it does is it just looks at your DNS requests. And there are many alternatives out there that are um, cheaper or even free and the idea is when you do something when you click on that link if it redirects you it usually redirects you to a command and control server so the malware can can be told what to do well the dns system goes no i don't think i'll let you do that and it can stop 70 percent of attacks just by filtering or using some kind of dns filtering system because okay. when, when when you do click your nan's link Mm -hmm. The DNS system goes, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not returning that because I know that's a troublesome site. And that's a very good tip to, to use DNS mm -hmm. filtering for yep. well, increasing for, security. For enterprise and for home. And lots mm -hmm. of, at home, for example, I have two networks, my network and the family network. The family network has got the Apple TV and the kids use. I have a Cisco firewall, but I've used a, a cheaper um, Bitdefender firewall. It, you just put it there. And you plug the family network into one side and you plug the internet into the other side and it's just automatically tuned to operate at home you don't even need to have a physical box i was using untangle for, for years. sure yeah yeah, yeah. on my yeah. nook yeah worked great even <laughs> using like um oh, the ahead. raspberry pi hole even the pi mm -hmm. hole stops a lot of advertising and a lot of pop-ups that you don't want go ahead Stu. Was okay. you about to... i was just saying this you know uh, you mentioned home security right and and that is something that we are dealing with constantly now. We're all working from home and we're now we are trusted with our corporate data at home. And, you know, normally we'd be at the office, we've got the firewalls, we've got all that filtering, but now we're at home and you made a really good point there is that we need to protect our home networks just as the same, right? And yep. so, yeah, DNS, I can tell you from personal experiences that, um, you know, having teenagers in the house, it's just like you have to protect the, uh, the core network and DNS filtering, like, um, you know, an example, like an umbrella uh, works really well. Right. Uh, yep. And, or sometimes like that. So that's really key, right. Is now we need to be more cognitive of when we're talking to our staff, that's, uh, you know, as a security professional, you say, well, I have this network that uh, all, all my employees are working from home. Now, how do I make sure that data is protected? How do I create policy? How do I um, that's a very important point. recommend? How do I make policy and recommend 
um, you should have this at home. Or maybe we should provide a special router firewall package for you as a working from home. Yep. Like, like a VPN. Um, right, something. yeah, filtering so, out so the traffic. When you're at, this is, that's a really key point, Stu. When you're at home, you should, probably shouldn't be using the corporate data on the same network that Susie's using for Netflix and little Johnny's using to play with his Game Boy or something. That's a key point, yeah. Are you, uh, you mentioned something else here about that, the DHCP. That might not be something that our uh, people in the webinar would have thought about today. So why do you need to be worried about the, your DHCP pools? Well, classic example, I, I bought a Netgear switch. It was an unmanaged switch. And I had a pool of network addresses. And they told me that my pool was exhausted. And I'm like, well, I'm counting through all the devices I've got. And I'm like, how come? And I looked it up. And the Netgear devices, even though they were unmanaged, were getting an IP address so they could upgrade firmware. Right. So be aware of what you've got on your network. And if suddenly your DHCP pool is exhausted, you're like, well, how have I got 35 devices? You know, I've only got three devices. Whereas my is looking for change. Change is not good. It may be something's happened, something that's not a big deal. But more likely, when something changes, it may be some sign of an attack or some kind of malware doing something interesting um okay that's that's not one of the things that i probably would have not necessarily thought about so that's that really... was another thing that most people they don't think about it with macro randomization and dhcp yes yeah. right yes. so it, every time your mac address changes you will get a new dhcp lease and if you have dhcp set to one day then what is the yeah. uh, amount of time that the address is unusable from the dhcp pool perspective twice that time right so for two one days week. <laughs> if you set it to one week and your yeah. market address changes then the address yeah. is gone from the pool for two weeks so it's easily exhaustible did, did jim mention that in some cases the some of the devices will create a mac randomization every 90 minutes or something he said if i if i didn't hear him correctly <laughs> i didn't 90 catch that, minutes but yeah. that, that would be quite crazy yeah if, especially if you've got a one week dhcp lease right or yeah. especially if you're yeah. in a hotel and they're presented with a splash page every 90 minutes <laughs> yeah. okay guys so uh, we have a little bit we have a very good high voltage question here let's go back to to the enterprise for for a sec okay mm -hmm. so we have talked about EAP, especially PEEP being honey potable, where you can bring your yep. software AP, you can send a DAUF, and then you can not force, but encourage devices to connect to your very strong SSID with the same SSID name. And the question is, how do you identify rogue APs and SSIDs in your corporate network? So there's a few different uh, things that you can look at, and then there's ways to kind of hide hide this. Uh, so one of the things with the rogue AP, <clears throat> you could look at its uh, configuration, right? So the beacons that are being advertised, you could start looking deeper into those. And so it's advertising features that you haven't enabled or that you don't support. That could be a difference, right? So if all of a sudden it's advertising two spatial stream support and all of your APs are four spatial streams, or you have 11K turned on and it has 11K disabled, you know, hey, the, the beacons are different. Uh, you can also look at things like the, the BSSIDs that are coming from that access point. So BSSID is the MAC address of the radio that yes. you have in your corporate environment. Yeah, so if, if it's different, if it's still using its defaults, you know that it's implemented by another vendor, someone not you, why is this AP advertising the same SSID I, I am with someone else's vendor code? Now these things are spoofable, so you can kind of hide some of that information, mm -hmm. but those are some of the things that would be tips. That, okay, so uh, let's say that you have capabilities to monitor over the air. Mm -hmm. against the honeypot attack. So you have, I don't know, monitoring radios in your access points and your uh, controllers or cloud systems. They can leverage that to, to see that in the air. I, I, How about the wired side? Oh, actually, one second. Are you familiar with any of that software or hardware that you could use to go and like track down these devices and see where they are and like, the impact they're having on the rest of the Wi-Fi network? I think there's some lovely tools. Yeah, if you can walk around yes. with some sort of device, yeah. keep on the own battery and things, and yeah, connect yeah. to your PC. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. that'd be lovely. I'm not sure what you're talking about. What's on your What's on your T-shirt? What's this? Now? What does this say? <laughs> so it's sidekick. Oh, Echohow and the Sidekick. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> that was a shameless slide. Just from some there. innocent product <laughs> placement, right? Just right up on the screen here. So, well, well, well actually, remember, it does packet capture as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so you can just do just do the occasional packet capture. It depends how advanced you want to get. You could write a little Python script, or you could just simply import it into Wireshark and look at the BSSIDs and like, 
hey, where are these five BSSs? No, but, no, but now, but now seriously, it's like a, I get to your organization, I, I get my directional antenna, I'm like three flows away from you, so we don't know I'm there, yep. but my RSSI in certain areas is higher than yours, and I'm trying to spoof your society to get user yep. credentials in EPEEP, so they say, oh, I accept the certificate, they've never seen it, but yeah, of course, must be secure. Uh, click next, next, and then I have username and password then yes. I can use to access your email perhaps or different systems. How do you really react to that? How do you make it, how do you make You sure? have to be proactive. How? So uh, I saw a question about WIPs and WIDs. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Cisco has an inbuilt WIDs function in their wireless LAN controller. Just turn it on and it will report the authentication attacks to you. Uh, you can buy a Raspberry Pi and load up Kismet and it will just say to you, hey, there's something happening here you may want to be aware of. It's not a great WIPs or WIDs, but it's making you aware that um, there's two devices with two different signal levels that yeah. have the same BSS ID. Okay, but when you are aware, is it can already be too late to, to react to that. Is there anything that you can do to stop these attacks from happening? No. You get like that RF paint on the yeah. walls and like <laughs> some RF shields on the windows. That's really all you can do. <laughs> Can you do like zero a wireless SSID's policy. SSID's contention or stuff like that to content the rogue APs, making sure that they are not... Well, you have to be very careful because yeah. if you deauthenticate them and it's not a rogue AP, you're actually breaking the law. Yeah. And it can be, you can get fines, you can get, you could get prison time. If you go around jamming other people's legitimate wireless, the FCC in the United States are very serious about jamming Wi-Fi. Now, if you, if you do something with your Wi-Fi, the jams my, that interferes with my Wi-Fi. There's nothing I can do about it. But if you purposely jam me, yeah. you can be fined a lot of money. Yeah, don't want to go down. Don't want to go, don't know, you don't want to go down that kind of rabbit <laughs> no. hole. Trust me. No, so um, talk to your legal department. We we are not lawyers, yeah. but yeah, our turning is on a feature. Important. But I wanted to highlight because it's very easy to click this one tick box in some vendor's dashboards. Oh, and attack! Yeah, and yeah. attack contain. The contain, I think, is the word, yeah. isn't it? Can, contain. Yeah. Because, contain uh, the the rogue. Yes. But most of the vendors do have a warning on that yes. screen when you do enable this feature. They're like, hey, maybe consult with your legal team. This could be repercussions, repercussions of turning on this feature. So but it like is technically possible. A very important yeah. thing here from our discussions here, read the warnings and understand what they mean, right? Do you Hopefully, trust yes. the certificate? Should you even see this warning? If it's a legitimate system where you trust the certificate being presented by a radio server when you do e-peep authentication, then you shouldn't see that warning. If you do see that, Maybe think about it, ask your IT if you should see that. So if something changes, yeah. warn users, if something changes, if you get something you don't expect, mm -hmm. let them know that you know, if you come down and talk to us, we're not going to be mad at you. Thank you. If, if something's different today, let us know because it's probably something malicious. See it, say it, sort it. If anyone's yeah. ever got on a oh, like train, <laughs> yeah. a train yeah. in, the, in the UK, <laughs> you would have heard that. C communication <laughs> is key, right? Is If you're going to be running Very massive much. networks, is always is always put out a little a notice like a few days before hey we're making some changes to it you may see something yes this is the expected result some but screenshots tell, tell and it's going to change yes a little internet website yeah just so you know because that'll that'll calm down on the on the tickets right and the calls right absolutely and i love the tips i saw on this when i was reading the uh, slides before the webinar and especially in our situation right now that we're currently in arizona we're going to be flying back to the uk soon but our flight's not until this evening we've had to check out of our room of course we want to be like, attached to our mobile devices so we can check what's going on on twitter slack instagram whatever it is you use so i'm going to be draining power from my devices so naturally i don't know if my device is going to last the whole day and then the whole flight so and i want to be able to you know stay connected and then I see this about, you know, don't plug your device into an unknown charging source. So I, I wouldn't really necessarily have thought twice about going to the airport, yeah. plugging my phone into a port in the airport to charge my phone whilst I'm sitting there waiting for my flight. So why do I not need to do this, Phil? Well, you have to understand that hackers are now criminally motivated and they have money to spend. They can actually create false fronts that look like the ATM machine at your bank. Mm -hmm. So putting something on top of a charging station is very easy to do. Obviously, you've got cameras in the airport, and the airport is probably the, well, hopefully the least likely you're going to get away with it. But, you know, you have, you have recharging points in coffee shops now. Yeah. And they, they're not engineers in the coffee shops. They don't know what it's doing. They don't know if someone's stuck a plate over the top. And just remember, how do you synchronize the data on your mobile device? You plug it into your laptop by USB, right? Yep. So, so, so I, I, simple fix for that, carry a little battery with you, 
uh, th there are loads of batteries out there that will charge while they are recharging. So you plug the battery in to charge to the unknown point, and then plug your device into your little battery. And then finally, you got here about QR codes, and I, I feel a bit concerned that you're <laughs> scaring our audience about QR codes because we put QR codes up on our web, and that quite, fine. A, quite a few times. But I promise you, ours ours is safe and secure. <laughs> but why do we sometimes not want to trust QR codes, Phil? If I can make a quick comment on that, somebody somebody put a QR code up. Multiple people have done this. They put QR codes up on the screen. Mm -hmm. Somebody commented, "Hey guys, security violation 101," and I'm like, "No." If they put a website up there, you type in the website, there's no difference. What my point here is, if you get a QR code from Echo, it's probably okay. If you're walking down the street... Hold on, hold on. It's not probably okay. It's 100% okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm from California, remember? I, I can't... Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. every attacker says. It's, it's, it's very, very highly... I'll even go as far as say it's going to be okay. If you're walking down the road and you see like an advert for a, a band and here's the QR code on a lamppost, Probably not okay, right? So common sense. Common. Uh, that's the key thing. Common sense. Yeah, very much so. Okay. So I appreciate we have like around ten minutes left, and we have another about a question about best practices for enterprise security. I know it's a broad, broad topic, but if you can give us like few pointers, guys, like I don't know, five tips or seven tips or eight and a half tips, we would appreciate that. Do's and don'ts in enterprise environment. What do you do? I think one of the, the, the key philosophies to adopt is how do we get the most security out of our implementation while creating the least amount of barriers to our users, right? So working under that, uh, that, that philosophy, I think is, is a good starting point. But as Phil mentioned earlier, changing the default settings, uh, making sure that you're authenticating clients connecting to your network, but also creating a situation where the clients can validate the network that they're connecting to. So before they give up their username and password or submit their certificates, they're validating that's actually a legitimate radius server mm -hmm. and monitoring for those things like has that uh, radius server changed? Do you get a new pop up window saying, hey, the certificate is different? Yeah, that should be a warning message to, uh, to users making that happen. Uh, looking at multiple layers of, uh, of techniques to protect yourself. So looking at encryption at layer two, so encryption over Wi-Fi, uh, encryption at layer three, looking at VPN tunnels. Uh, upper layer encryption, so TLS, SSL encryptions to secure your, your web traffic, but having multiple layers of defense is a good strategy instead of putting all of your eggs into to one basket. Completely agree. So we can put all this information into our security policy as part of our organization. Mm -hmm. And now when it comes to dot one X, can, can, I, can, yeah, I just of course. can you go back one slide? <laughs> you just raised a key point. Have a policy. If you haven't got a policy, it's not me, it's Nick Smith. From the QA. All right, but if you don't have a policy, how can you stick to it? Have a policy, even Absolutely. if it's just like start off with don't click on er erroneous certificates and then build up the policy over time. You can go to Sun's website and get a basic policy for free that they've created. Um, then there's loads of free resources. I cannot remember the website, sorry, because it's, it's convoluted, but you can sign up to NIST and the NSA and they will say to you, what threats they are seeing at the moment. So if you work in a warehouse, you probably don't care about the hospital threats. If you work in a hospital, you care about the hospital threats. This is stuff you can sign up for, and they will send you advisories and guidelines. For free. For free. Yeah. Super nice to have. That'd be lovely, yeah. Yeah, and, and this slide that we put up here, we're not going to talk through all of the tips. What we need you to do is just grab a, grab a screenshot, and then you can you know, use this at your own leisure. Um, but we wanted to throw some you know, tips out there for you to help you with your security. But you know, the first one that uh, I will just cover and say is that it's really important that you do that survey your space periodically. There can be so many changes into the, in the environment. You know, we've seen so many times where, um, let's say, for example, you've got like TVs or printers in, in the environment that you're in, like in the office space, and you've done the right thing by disabling their Wi-Fi radios because they're connected via a physical LAN cable into the corporate network, so they don't need to have their Wi-Fi radios enabled. But then all of a sudden, like you said, feel around your neck gear, a uh, switch was just stealing some IP addresses to do a firmware upgrade without you know telling you. Tell me, yeah. mm -hmm. These devices, they would also do firmware upgrades and update themselves. And then sometimes what they do is they re-enable their Wi-Fi radios. So one, it's a weak and easy method of access that people could get access to your corporate network. And two, it causes contention issues on the Wi-Fi as well. So it's going to be impacting the performance of your wireless users in your space. So the only the best thing you can do to try and avoid that is making sure your 
surveying these spaces periodically, doing your health check surveys, mm -hmm. and ensuring that nothing like some some of these things are not happening in your space. So that's one of the ones I wanted to make sure we uh, touched on out of our ten. Can I just add another one to that? Yeah, of course you can. We've got this awesome tool called a Sidekick. Have we? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did we mention that? <laughs> have you have you walked around your house and surveyed your house? Uh, uh, of course. Yeah. Times, yeah. But I mean, the audience have you have you surveyed your house? If you had this wonderful device from work that fine-tuned your company vehicle, wouldn't you run it on your spouse's vehicle as well? You've got the sidekick, walk around your house, see what you can see. You may be unpleasantly surprised what you can see from your house. Oh, like a um, an LED light that your daughter just bought off of Amazon that has a broadcasting SSID on it for no apparent reason? Yep. Mm -hmm. well, actually, that I can't connect to? Yep. That they, she may have plugged into your Ethernet. Well, actually, right. we, we, had, we was teaching an ECSE design class uh, boot camp before the conference started this week. And we was talking to one of the students in the class about a, an interesting device that they had to support on the wireless network that was causing um, them a headache. And it was this, um, I think it was, it's like a lava lamp or it's like a buddy lamp. Buddy lamp. Mm -hmm. yeah. Buddy lamp. So, yeah. you know, I would, I think me and Mac are going to get one after hearing about this. <laughs> oh, yeah. So oh, I, can sure have, one. I can have my buddy lamp at home. Mac can have his buddy lamp at his. And when I touch the buddy lamp, it lights up his lamp. So, so, so cute. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're shocked that we haven't already got one already, but we didn't even know about these buddy lamps. But anyway, the, um, the guy in the class was like, we needed to support these devices on our network. And it was just an absolute nightmare trying to get them to work and this, that, and the other. So I thought that was quite a funny uh, Wi-Fi client device that you can have now. It is funny. We'll definitely have that. When you touch the lamp, it lights up, then I know I can start texting you. Yeah. <laughs> So you're never alone with those. There's just you two guys and the government watching you at all times. <laughs> no, I feel. I don't think it's that guys, yeah. I feel. I feel we have we have uh, time for a question or two, if you don't mind. And there was a very good question from uh, from Terry Wolf about the concerns in security for cloud managed uh, platforms for Wi-Fi systems. What is your mm. take on cloud managed platforms and security? Yeah, so there's a few different uh, things to think about. Uh, one, you can have security concern about your data being hosted in someone else's environment. So personally identifiable information like MAC addresses, IP addresses, usernames, that kind of thing. So is that information allowed to be stored in someone else's environment? Uh, is that information allowed to leave the country depending on where the cloud servers are? Are you crossing international borders? Uh, that kind of thing that can present concerns. Um, the people who are running operations for that cloud-based platform do they have access to your data, right? As they manage and move uh, new platforms around, uh, that could also be a concern. So you want to ask those questions, uh, see what, have, what uh, they have access to. Uh, and also if, uh, if there's, and many cloud platforms have this, they have uh, API access, right? So there may be inadvertently some back doors open um, if you haven't uh, closed off, locked off, or you know, uh, expired uh, certain token keys that may still be used to access your information. Okay, so it is, it can be a concern. It, it can be. But, there, but also there are doors I, you can to, close. I would like to add that typically users' data is like the active data being exchanged between the client and the access point is not being sent to the cloud, right? So cloud is typically like a management platform in most cases and monitoring platform. So while you can have some elements of data that is identifiable, yeah. like a data data typically never leaves your premise. We, on a wireless cloud vendor, the data is put there by the by the AP yeah. and it stays local. Yes. But personally identifiable information can be stored in the cloud. And is that a real concern? Like there are tons of vendors that are doing, that are get, yeah. going this route now. You have to weigh up the benefits with the risks. So as long as, as long as you trust the vendor, Echo Cloud. I trust everyone. <laughs> I, security I, warning, security warning. I, tr I, trust, I trusted Phil before about an hour ago. So, <laughs> so you said you're going to give me a copy of your social security number and your credit cards. Of course, Should we, should we do that offline or should we do it now? No, we can do it now. <laughs> we can record it here so we can rewatch the webinar. <laughs> show, get number. show everybody your new credit card. Can we see the back? Sure, guys. I they want to see the back. Yeah. Well, um, Usually we would run over and take a few more questions, but Troy would probably kill me if I allowed that today because he did say to me he needs to leave on time so he can go, to catch. Go, yeah. go catch a flight. So we're in a slightly different uh, situation as the normal. So we are going to wrap up the webinar now. So I just want to say thank you so much for everyone for joining us at this special live WLPC. Thank you to the Echo Marketing team. We've got our sidekick, Stu, but most importantly to our special guest today, 
Troy and Phil. Thank, thank you for you sharing. Thanks for having us. So Thanks many, for having us. Yeah, so many great Wi-Fi security tips. I'm super paranoid now. I'm scared to have Wi-Fi devices turned on around me, around you, Phil, especially, and especially <laughs> going to the airport now. I am not plugging myself into anything until I get home. But thank you very much, everyone. Stay uh, safe, everyone. Yeah, stay safe, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. See you, guys. Bye.